How American Politics Went Insane by The Atlantic. How American Politics Went Insane. It happened gradually, and until the U.S. figures out how to treat the problem, it will only get worse. It's 2020, four years from now. The campaign is underway to succeed the president, who is retiring after a single wretched term. Voters are angrier than ever at politicians, at compromisers, at the establishment. Congress and the White House seem incapable of working together on anything, even when their interests align. With lawmaking at a standstill, the President's use of executive orders and regulatory discretion has reached a level that Congress views as dictatorial. Not that Congress can do anything about it except file lawsuits that the divided Supreme Court its three vacancies unfulfilled, unfilled, has been able, unable to resolve. On Capitol Hill, Speaker Paul Ryan resigned after proving unable to pass a budget or much else. The House burned through two more speakers and one acting speaker, a job invented following four speakerless months. The Senate, meanwhile, is tied in knots by wannabe presidents and aspiring talk show hosts. <laughs> aspiring talk show hosts who use the chamber as a social media platform to build their brands by obstructing, well, everything. The Defense Department is among hundreds of agencies that have not been reauthorized. The government has shut down three times, and yes, it finally happened. The United States briefly defaulted on the national debt, precipitating a market collapse and an economic downturn. No one wanted that outcome, but no one was able to prevent it. As the, pres as the presidential primaries unfold, Kane West is the front runner. Kane West is the leading fractured field of Democrats. The Republican frontrunner is Phil Robertson of the Duck Dynasty fame. Elected governor of Louisiana only a few months ago, he has promised to defy Washington estab the Washington establishment by never trimming his beard. <laughs> Party elders have given up, given up, all pretense of being more than spectators, and most of the candidates have given up all pretense of party loyalty. On the debate stages and everywhere else, anything goes. I could continue, but you get the gist. Yes, the political future I've described is unreal, but it is also linear extrapolation of several trends on vivid display right now. Astonishingly, the 2016 Republican presidential race has been dominated by a candidate who is not, in any meaningful sense, a Republican. According to registration records, since 1987, Donald Trump has been a Republican, then an Independent, then a Democrat, then a Republican, then I do not wish to enroll in a party, then a Republican. He has donated to both parties. He has shown loyalty. He, he, he has donated to both parties. He has shown loyalty to an affinity for neither. The second place candidate, Republican Senator Ted Cruz, built his brand by tearing down his party's slurring the Senate Republican leader, railing against the Republican establishment, and closing the government as a career move. The Republicans' noisy breakdown has been echoed eerily, albeit less loudly, on the Democratic side. Or after the early primaries, 
one of the two remaining contestants for the nomination was not, in any meaningful sense, a Democrat. Senator Bernie Sanders was an independent who switched to nominal Democratic affiliation on the day he filed for the New Hampshire primary, only three months before that election. He surged into second place by winning independents while losing Democrats. If it had been up to the Democrats to choose their party's nominee, Sanders' bid would have collapsed after Super Tuesday. In their various ways, Trump, Cruz, and Sanders are demonstrating a new principle. The political parties no longer have either intelligible boundaries or enforceable norms, and as a result, renegade political behavior pays. Political disintegration plagues Congress, too. House Republic Republicans barely managed to elect a speaker last year. Congress did agree in the fall on a budget framework intended to keep the government open through the election, a signal accomplishment by today's low standards. But in April, hardline conservatives had revoked the deal, thereby humiliating the new speaker and potentially causing another shutdown crisis this fall. As of this writing, it's not clear whether the hardliners will push to the brink, but the bigger point is this. If they do, there is not much that party leaders can do about, about it. And there is still the bigger point. The very term party leaders has become an anachronism. Although Capitol Hill and the campaign trail are miles apart, the breakdown in order of in both places reflects the underlying reality that there is no that there no longer is anything there no longer is anything such there no longer is anything such thing as part, a party leader that doesn't make any sense okay the way they wrote it basically there's no such thing as a party leader okay there are only individual actors pursuing their own political interests and ideological missions willy-nilly, like excited gas molecules in an overheated balloon. <laughs> no wonder Paul Ryan, taking the gavel as the new and reluctant House Speaker in October, complained that the American people looked at Washington and all they see is chaos. The American people look at Washington, all we see is chaos. Yep, that's what I see. What a relief to them. It would be if we finally got our act together. No one seemed inclined to disagree. Nor was there much argument two months later when Jeb Bush, his presidential campaign sinking, used the C word in a different but equally apt context. Donald Trump, he said, is a chaos candidate, and he'd be a chaos president. All right, so we're just going to scroll down again. Not much time. Trump, however, didn't cause the chaos. The chaos caused Trump. What we are seeing is not a temporary spasm of chaos, but chaos syndrome. Chaos Syndrome is a chronic decline in the political system's capacity for self-organization. It begins with the weakening of the institutions and brokers, political parties, career politicians, and congressional leaders and committees that have historically held politicians accountable to one another and prevented everyone in the system from pursuing naked self-interests all the time. As these intermediary influence fades, politicians, activists, and voters all become more individualistic and unaccountable. The system atomizes. Chaos becomes the new normal, both in campaigns and in the government itself. All right. Um, I'm going to post the link to this article in the description box. I would suggest you read it, the rest of it. 
uh, because it's really good. Um, I'm going to have to miss reading a lot. Uh, okay. Like many disorders, chaos syndrome is self-reinforcing. It causes governmental dysfunction, which fuels public anger which incites political disruption, which causes yet more governmental dysfunction. Reversing the spiral require understanding it. Consider, then, the etiology of political disease. The immune system that defended the body, po body politic for two centuries, the gradual dismantling of that immune system, the emergence of pathogens capable of exploiting the new vulnerability, the symptoms of the disorder, and finally is prognosis and treatment. Immunity. I'm going to go ahead and leave it here. And maybe I'll do a part two. I don't know. But read this. All this. All right. I've only got a few more minutes. The Constitution makes no mention of many of the essential political structures that we take for granted, such as political parties and congressional committees. If the Constitution were all we had, politicians would be incapable of getting organized to accomplish even routine tasks. Okay. Da -da -da. Onward and downward. There was something at the bottom. And... Boy, I hate only having 15 minutes. Let's see. This goes really goes into the history of things. And this is pretty good. Okay. As you can see, it's a lot of reading. <laughs> sure. Donald Trump and other viruses. Should write Hillary Clinton next to that. But this this is full. Of, this is great. Uh, okay. Down to the bottom. Chaos syndrome as a psychiatric disorder. I don't have a quick solution to the current mess, but I do think it would be easy in principle to start moving in a better direction. Although returning parties and middlemen to anything like their 19th century glory is not conceivable or in today's America even desirable. Strengthening parties and middleman is very doable. All right. Well, I think I'm going to end it here. Right here. The biggest obstacle, I think, is the general public's re re reflexive, unreasoning hostility to politicians in the process of politics. Neurotic hatred of the political class is the country's last universal acceptable form of bigotry. Because that problem is mental, not mechanical, it's really hard to remedy. I disagree with this whole thing right there. B.S. All right. The public is reflexive. The public is reasoning. And the reason we're hostile towards the politicians to the point of neuroses is because they are lying pieces of garbage. Every one of them. And I hate liars. Alright, have a good day. Bye everybody.